unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Galatians chapter 5. If you're there, you say amen. Verses 6. The Bible says, for in Jesus Christ, somebody say in Jesus Yes. The Bible says that in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth anything. Praise God. He says, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. But the Bible says, but faith which worketh by love. If you're writing notes, if you're typing somewhere, I want you to just write, faith which worketh by love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I've promised to share this because I realized that there's a huge, huge mistake that I see with saints every day pertaining a certain walk with God. And no wonder many believers have faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? They have faith, quote unquote. In other words, they have an idea of what faith is. They believe that they have faith. In fact, some come after some time and they say, Apostle, I prayed. Yeah, I said that before. And I fasted and I did everything I could. And I, can't, I, I just don't see results. You told me to have faith. I have applied faith. I have confessed. I have done everything right. I've gone to uh, 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 an apostle. I've visited the preacher. I've gone to a deliverance service. An evangelist spoke on my life. A prophet prophesied. Things have been done. I've gone under. I've gone on mountains. I've gone in valleys. I've gone in overnights. I've gone in over days. I've done everything. But I don't seem to see results in my life. Why is it that I don't move things easily? Why is it that I don't see answers easily? Why is it that I do too much to get little? Why is it that I apply myself every day to faith, but I don't see results? It's because many of you don't know how faith works. And I'm going to show you how faith works. How faith works. How faith works. I have realized this over time. And I thank God for a certain man of God, a wonderful man of God, called Kenneth E. Hagen. How many of you heard of Kenneth E. Hagen? In my earlier years of experiencing God in university, I landed on his works. I read Kenneth E. Hagen's works in my earlier years. And I'm not ashamed to give honor to whom honor is due. And praise to whom praise is due. That would be offense before God not to recognize that that man's works had an effect on my earlier life in the gospel. He's literally the father of the word and faith movement. You understand? So bless his soul for that. But that man made one simple statement in one of the books I read many, many years ago. And he always said, if you walk out of love, you will die. Of course, he never elucidated of whether it was spiritual or physical. But he already said, if a man walks out of love, he dies. And over the years, I can tell you by experience, this has been true. And I'm going to prove it by scripture. I'm going to prove it by scripture. He already said that statement. But he never broke it down to explain or give reference to Bible to the Bible, but I know that he was right. And I'm going to prove that to you today by scripture, that it is true. Now, if you are the kind of person that has believed God for a long time for something, and that thing has failed to come, 
or you've believed God for a sudden change, of course, in your life, and that change has refused to come. Question, examine, take some time, and understand and study yourself against the law of love. I'm not talking about what you assume is love. I'm talking about what is love. I'm not talking about your definition of love. I'm talking about God's definition of love. If you study your love life, you will realize that your walk of love somewhere is warped. Either for God or for man. But there is something somewhere in your equation of love that is faulty. Either for God or for man. Always examine your love walk. You realize that many of the things that are not happening for you are as a result of how you have walked in your love walk. If the Bible tells you that faith worketh by love, if there is no love in the understanding, if there is no love in the revelation, if there is no love in the equation, you can pray, you can fast, you can go on the prayer mountain and seek God for 17 years, days, until even your body starts oozing an old funny smell because you want God. You know, some people think that every action depicts love, okay? That's why Corinthians shocks you and tells you, even if you give your goods to the poor, but have not love. Not everybody who is serving is serving in the love of God. Not everybody who is doing things in the church of Jesus Christ is doing them for the love of God. Not everybody who extends a favor to those that I need is extending it by the love of God. Not everybody who does whatever they do does it by the love of God. But he said, even if you give your body to be burned and have not love, it profited you nothing. That means that even people who have died as saints and martyrs in the gospel, but if they examine their love walk, it was deluded. It's possible to see somebody do things that prove love, express love, but when you enter their heart and examine it, there is no true love. So don't be mistaken about the things people do. He said in Christ, neither circumcision, what you do, nor uncircumcision, or what you don't do. Prophet is what well as anything. But he said, but faith which worketh by love. It's not what you do. It's not what you don't do. It's the revelation of love. Now let's go beyond what you do because what some people do can be deceptive. There's somebody right now on the face of the earth extending a cup of tea for somebody who's going to kill. And he has put poison in that tea. And he's saying, hello, take the tea. You understand? And in just a couple of minutes, this person's body is going to succumb to the poison and they're going to die. But at that particular point, the act there looks like it is what? It is love. The Lord taught me at the age of 19 one of the most powerful things that I believe has endured and established me as a minister of God. And I learned it the easy and the hard way by experience with God. By the age of 19, he told me, if you're going to be a success in ministry, if you're going to be a successful minister, if you're going to go high and so high, understand the law of love. Now, this might not be, you know, of course some of you, by, by hearing this it looks so obvious. But in a few minutes it's not going to be. It might look as obvious, but in a few minutes as I share, just give me a few, ear, a few, a few, a few of your time. You will understand that it's not as obvious as you thought. Because you can uh, live in a very deceived form of love, yet it is not love. Remember love is for definitions in the Greek. The Greek have four words that all are translated in the Bible as love. You understand? Phileo. That's brotherly love. The love you share for your brother or your sister. Huh? That's one, 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 one definition of love. But in the English version of your Bible, it will say love. Then there is eros. The passion that people share as a couple, right? Husband and wife. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not last boyfriend and girlfriend. No. 
Praise God. <laughs> Why have you gone quiet? <laughs> Praise God. So there is phileo, brotherly love. There is eros, right? Passion. There is stoge, friendship. Right? If you are my friend, if I extend a place of friendship, right? People, there are people who are married who share eros, but they're not friends. And there are people who share stoge, friendship, but they don't have eros, passion. It's not, they are not intimate. They don't even have any business. They're just there. What's up? You're my buddy. Praise God. <laughs> and there are couples who don't have both. Hello? Now the fourth one is agape. Somebody say agape. Agape is the God kind of love. Somebody say the God kind of love. Now, when he defines in Corinthians, if I have not love, the word there for love is not eros, it's not stoge, it's not phileo, it's agape. We're defining the God kind of love. The way God loves. Not the way you love as a friend. Not the way you relate with a brother in brotherly love. Not in the way you are intimate or passionate with your wife or your husband. We're talking about the way God loves. The way God loves. And then he goes to define it in Corinthians. Huh? Firstly, he, if you go in 1 Corinthians 13, right? Let, let's go there. I, I need to read for you a few, a few special things there. You, you realize he... Uh -huh, go, next verse. Verse... Uh, no, 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 go, 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 go. Verse 3, I think. Verse 4, verse 4. Verse four, yes. He says, love, charity, hmm? it suffers long. Now, I want to, everywhere you see love, agape, put God. Do you understand? Maybe give me the New Living Translation. Give me the New Living Translation. Uh -huh. God is patient. Okay? Because God is love. How many of you know that God is love? And I'll read for you that later. God is love. Now he says, God is patient. God is kind. God is not jealous. Not, that, not the other one. Eh? Uh, there, is, there is that jealousness of God over you. But not the jealousness of, I'm jealous because you have what I don't have. That, that's the kind of jealousness they're talking about, right? God is not boastful or proud. God is not rude. God does not demand his own way. God is not irritable. He keeps no record of being wrong. Wronged. No record of being wrong. No record. Yeah, yes. He keeps no record of being what? Wronged. And the next verse says, He does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins. Hallelujah. He never gives up. He never loses faith in somebody. He is always hopeful in somebody. He endures through every circumstance about somebody. And whether prophecy and speaking in unknown languages will all become useless. But he says, but love will last forever. The KJV says it never fails. But he says there will be a point where even prophecy or speaking in unknown languages uh, languages or special language will become useless. That means prophecy has an end. Even the knowledge we preach has an end. Hallelujah. Even the, 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 the language, the, the tongues you speak, they have an end. But he has spoken about the one eternal thing. That is why I tell people love exists in all dimensions of the spirit. From the first dimension to the most uncountable dimension in the spirit, love has stood divine, unadulterated, undefiled. It incomparable. It's incomparable. That is that is agape. I'm talking about the love of God. The way God loves you. Hallelujah. The way God loves you. Timothy, the son of Paul, he writes to in First Timothy chapter one, and 
And he, he, he tries to exhort his son in a certain direction. This is a father speaking to Timothy, right? And he says, and to Timothy, my son in the faith, he tells him, grace, mercy, peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the next verse says, and I besought thee, he told him, I asked you, I besought you to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now I want you to underline the word doctrine, comma. Neither give heed to fables, give me the amplified of that, Verse 4, neither give heed importance to, to occupy themselves with legends, fables, myths, endless genealogies, which foster and promote useless speculations and questionings rather than acceptance in faith of God's administration to the divine training that is in faith. That leaning on the entire personality of God, on absolute trust and confidence. And he continues to say, whereas the object, listen, this is Paul telling Timothy, whereas the object and purpose of our instruction and charge is agape, the object of our purpose, all our instruction and charge is love. That's the object of the Christian faith. That is the ultimate instruction of the Christian faith. That is the ultimate purpose that sums up the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now what you people take lightly is, love is not among the elements of the Christian walk. Mercy, forgiveness, faithfulness. No, it is the object and purpose of our instruction. Praise God. It's the object and purpose, that the end of everything that every Christian should understand. If you do not know how to prophesy, if you don't know how to heal the sick, if you don't know how to cast out devils, if you don't know how to cleanse lepers, that's okay. But every man which has been instructed in the way of the spirit understands agape. They understand the love of God. And he says, which springs, this love, which springs from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere and unfeigned faith. It springs from a pure heart, a good conscience, and unfeigned faith. The faith that does not deceive the self. The faith that does not lie to itself that it's going to have results tomorrow, that it's going to see the power of God. It confesses, oh, this is happening in my life. I'm going ahead. I'm going upward. I'm going in the name of Jesus. They will not kill me. They will not fire me. And then they fire you. <laughs> Praise God. And the next verse says that, but certain individuals, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, certain individuals have missed the mark on this very matter. And have wandered away into, you know, when a man doesn't understand the walk of love, this is what they become. They wander into vain arguments, useless arguments, and discussions, and purposeless talk. They're in purposeless talk. Give me the message of that. Maybe you'll understand it. Message verse 6. He says, those who fail to keep this point soon wander off into caldel sacks of what? Of what? Of what? Of what? When you don't understand the way of love, you're a natural gossiper. Natural. They don't even need to appeal to you. No man gossips and understands the law of love. Whether you're right or wrong in your gossip, no man gossips and understands the way of love. Some of you think certain things will never happen in your life because you gossip. There you won't say amen and I understand. You're full of jealousness. You're full of envy. You're full of strife. You're full of purposeless talk. You always know who is this, this, who did that, who was with who, how, where, when, what. You understand? You're always indulging in the affairs of people. You can't even, there are people who can't even settle in their own house. Their neighbors don't know them. Not because they are busy. No. But because they, they are, they are always they're always less restless about where they will find news. 
I know this might not be popular for some of you, but I want you to understand that no man of God is going to speak a prophetic word on your life and change your course if you don't understand this way. The basis of our instruction, our doctrine, our charge is love. So people engage into vain jungling. They speak things, purposeless talk. They went about in vain arguments, useless, vain discussions. That means you speak things that are useless. They don't have results. They have no power in the other realm. If you don't learn to exercise your spirit from certain conversations, you will never see God. If you sit around men with vain conversations, walk away. Because you have your future and 20, 30 years ahead of you and somebody's bringing some rotten conversation in your face. Remember, every time you sit among the scorners, you partake of the curse of the scorner. Because the Bible is clear. The tell bear is the same as he that is told. How do you entertain certain things? How do you entertain purposeless talk? How do you entertain vain conversations? How do you entertain them? Christians, stay away from cheap talk if you want to see God a certain way. If you want to see God a certain way, stay away from purposeless conversations. Stay away from things that will dissuade you from the course. You were, God did not create you on the earth eh, to know who ate meat last night. No. God created on you, you on the earth to fulfill your purpose on the earth and go to meet your maker and let him tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. That's why you're in the gospel. That's why the Bible tells you to do all diligence, to mind your own business. To work with your own hands that you might have a testimony amidst them that are without. Study to be quiet. You know, study. As in, be a student of quietness. Be a student of quietness. Be a student of minding your own business. That means, don't just decide it. Study. It's a deliberate effort to put your flesh under from certain conversations. If people start certain conversations, you're not there. Praise God. You can't find me under some conversations. It is hard for you to talk with me for 10 minutes and God is not in the equation. It is impossible. You ask those who have talked to me personally. It's hard for you to come and talk to me for 10 minutes or 5 and not find God in the equation. I, I don't have time for vain conversations. Are you hearing me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Study. Study. As in... Be a student. He even did tell you try. No, he says study. Study to be quiet. Study. Like study. As in be a student of silence. You understand? Be a student of minding your own business. That means learn to be quiet. Learn to mind your own business. And work with your own hands as we commanded you. Learn. Just learn. Some of you I know you can't keep quiet. You can in the name of Jesus. You can. You you can do your own business. You can. You ah. come on. Tell your neighbor, Sobola, You can. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can. You can simply, and, and you can even switch out people who are like that. It's very easy. You you just don't give opinion. You tell him how. Ah, you know, I'm sorry. That kind of conversation doesn't mix in my love walk. It doesn't. Now, he says, go back to where I was. He says that they have engaged in purposeless talk. And the next verse says, uh -huh, they are ambitious, listen, to be doctors of the law, teachers of the mosaic ritual, but they have no understanding either of the words and terms they use or of the subjects about which they make such dogmatic assertions. Now, it's interesting that Paul puts people who teach the law in the class of people who don't understand love. Why do you preach the grace gospel? Because the gospel is a love language between God and man. That is why we preach the forgiveness of sins. Paul said it in Corinthians 13. 
He said, be it known unto you, brethren, that through this man is the forgiveness of sins. Through this man is the forgiveness of, thing, of sins. And, 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 and through him is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And the next verse says, and, 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 uh, and by him, by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says when the Jews were gone out, the Gentiles besought him that he come the next Sabbath and speak about these words. Don't bring the law. He, they told him, next Sabbath? He says, come and repeat these words. These words. These very words. The Gentiles besought him. He says, when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought them. These words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. What Sabbath? Why? Because the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, was always telling them judgment, fury, anger, God's wrath, the lion, which will consume you, kill you, die. You understand? So everybody was living in a relationship with God where they were expecting judgment and judgment and judgment and judgment. And this man comes and tells them there is a forgiveness of sins and all that believe are justified from all things which Moses, they teach you every Sunday, cannot justify you of. Oh, the Gentiles are like, come back next Sabbath and preach this gospel. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the next verse says, I want us, I want us to, to, to go through that, that very scripture of Acts. Uh -huh. When the Jews saw the multitudes, again, you see, uh -uh, go back, go back before, before, before. When, and uh -huh, next verse 42. Uh -huh. When the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought these words that they might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And the next verse says, and when the congregation was broken up, the Bible says, many Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Leave the law. And the next verse says, and the next Sabbath day came, and the Bible says, almost the whole city. The reason why you are preaching the grace gospel, people come and then you tell them to sin, then they come many. <laughs> No! The reason why Fanero continues to grow is very simple. We are telling them these words. This is the gospel. Of course, the next verse says, and when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, spoke against those things which Apostle Grace spoke, contradicting and blaspheming. It's normal. It's normal. Continue in the grace. Now you realize this, he speaks from explaining people how they've gone into endless genealogies, myths, ministering questions in the hearts of their hearers rather than godly edification, which is after faith. They're, 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 they have missed this mark, he says. They have missed this mark. And then he says, as though you're thinking of normal people, simple people, and he tells you, no, it's actually the folk who desire to be teachers of the law. Not knowing what they say, neither from whence they are firm. They don't even know what they're talking about. And Paul is telling you, those men walked out of love. Every time you preach the law, you take men out of love. Every time you preach grace, you take men into love. Never forget that. Because grace is expressed through love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not, should not. I love that he says, should not perish. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Should not perish. It's not a will not. It's no longer even in your power when you believe. It's no longer in your in your choice when you leave. No. It's in the divine command and mandate of Jehovah God to begin that work in you and see to accomplishment to the day of Christ. Let me tell you, when I got born again, I knew I was going to heaven and no man can convince me. Otherwise. Because in Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's a faith that walketh with love. In John 7, John chapter 7, those of you probably have read this. Luke, Luke, sorry, Luke chapter 7. The Bible speaks of a certain man. He was a Roman soldier, centurion. 
And this man, the Bible tells us, he loved his nation in verse 5. He loved, he, he loved his nation. And he built even the, the, the believers there in the synagogue. But he wasn't a believer in their God. He was just a man who loved his nation. He, he had love. He, had, he, had, he, he, he agaped his nation. He, the love of God worked in him for the nation. And, 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 and he even built their God, the, the, the Jewish God, an altar, a synagogue. And one time his servant fell sick. You remember the story? And the Bible says, I think the KJV says he was ready to die. One version says he was ready, the servant was ready to die. And so these guys come to Jesus and beseech him that he heal this man, this man's servant, because he loved his servant greatly. And the Bible tells us, so if you have read the story, this man comes to Jesus and he says, much as I have love, right, I know I am unworthy to come to you. You understand? I know that I'm not worthy of myself to come to you. Are you worthy to come to my house? So this man also, in spite of his love, he, he knew his shortcomings and his weaknesses as a man. And he, of course, he didn't just say it out of the blue. He must have had these issues. I think in his heart there are things he had done and were like, ah, yeah, 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 if Jesus comes in my house. Uh -uh. He tells him, you know what? I'm not worthy for you to come to me, neither my worthy, I mean, to come to my house, neither my worthy to approach you. And he tells him, send a word. Because I'm a man under authority. When I tell my soldiers, do this, they do it. When I tell them, go, they do it. You understand? They do it. You're a man under authority. Send forth your word. Somebody shout hallelujah. And what does the verse 9 say? Verse 9 says, Jesus had these things. He marveled at him and turned about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. What prompted the spirit of faith? It began with love. What people don't see is the love he had for his servant. What people don't see is the love that he had for his nation. It's the love that he had for the Jews. Yet a Roman. It's the faith that worketh by love. That love compelled him and sort of there's a very thin line when a man is compelled by love. The miraculous is not even something you plead for. It automatically comes. Now, many of you have read the scriptures many times. And you see Jesus healing the sick, casting out devils, cleansing lepers. But how many of you have read that when Jesus was moved by compassion and he healed them all? The son of God did not just wake up in the morning and then he said, ah... You know, let me just heal. No. The Bible says, and, I, and he, Jesus went forth. He saw a great multitude. He was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Do you see the Son of God? What proceeds in the spirit of the Son of God? He feels compassion for them and heals them. Today we have people who say, can I do a luxury miracle? Can I, can I, can I heal? I'm going to show you that I'm going to heal. You understand? I'm going to show you that I'm going to heal. You, you, you look at the guy, there is no compassion in him. That's another spirit. That is not the spirit of the instruction and doctrine and charge of the Christian faith. The Christian, somebody said, I'm going to do it. I saw one time a young guy, yeah, a little young guy, very young, very young. I mean, not age, but spiritually. Very young, young, very young, young, very young prophet. He said, I'm going to do a miracle simply because I can. I looked. I looked at the dude. I said, what? In my head, he wants to do a miracle simply because he can. You mean Jesus healed simply because he could? You're not even putting importance to the power of God that is moving in this being to heal them. If it's a miracle, then it's not a miracle from God. God does not heal simply because he can. He just doesn't get bored from chewing gum and spits it. Then he says, okay, heal. No, that's not the God you believe. He heals you because he loves you. Somebody shout hallelujah. Some of you say, oh, I need power to heal the sick. How much compassion do you have? Many years ago, I worked in Hospice. How many of you know Hospice? Hospice is a palliative care institute that looks after the terminally ill, especially the, the cancers, uh, cancer victims, right? 
And I, believe, I, I remember, I thank God for that, that somehow in my university days, I had an opportunity to volunteer as a social worker in hospice, that palliative care. And of course, we used to, you know, counsel, pre bereavement, counseling, pre bereavement, da 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 da. We used to follow up cases in, 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 in hospitals. We used to go, you know, in home visits. We used to discuss cases. We, so we, we used to get attached to these people. Mm -hmm. And I remember I worked there for about four months, close to about four. And I remember, and I used to go there almost, you know, as every day, almost every day of my week. People used to die when I'm watching. People died. You understand? And I remember one day this little boy in Mulago, he was called Sereko. He got, you know, one of those cancers. I think it was a, it was a, something like leukemia or something. And I started to preach Jesus to this young man. I used to teach him. I used to preach Jesus to him. I used to preach Jesus to him. And I remember we got him a little radio where he would listen to the gospel. And this boy's body goes deteriorating every day. And I remember the day he died, he was calling my name. Grace, Grace, Grace. You know, he, he was dying calling my name. You, you get my point? I saw a lady who had stage 4 cancer, HIV, and tuberculosis all in one body. Had lost 11 relatives in Rwanda in the genocide. Came to Kampala with nothing. Had two children. The husband left. She left her children in the house to go to Mlago for treatment. The, the, her landlord locked the house. The kids walked away and disappeared. She never saw her kids. And she's in Mulago eating beans and rice and, and, and posho. And fried beans. And she's swallowing anti-TB drugs, chemotherapy, and antiretrovirus. You look at these people. You get my point, eh? And compassion comes naturally. It just comes naturally. You just feel. And I remember one day, I came from hospice, and I came back home. We used to have a little tree there in the, my father's compound. It was about 8 p.m., and I sat under that tree. I was full of pain in my heart because I was tired of burying people. I felt too much pain in my spirit. Too much pain in my spirit. It was too much pain in my spirit because I was tired of burying people. And I remember that time I sat under that tree. It was about 8 p.m. Nobody knew I was sitting under that tree. And I remember telling God, how can people die when I'm watching? You understand? It disturbed me. And the Lord spoke words to me under that tree. The Lord spoke to me words under that tree. That was the first time after those words under that tree that are between me and him that I saw the first stage four cancer heal. Do you understand what I'm saying? That was the first time I saw the first stage four cancer heal. I saw it with my eyes. I saw it with my eyes. And since then, I started to see cancerous people heal. Even my mom, one time, is my witness. Uh, my mom is here. She had a friend. I think Kedress, is it? She had cervical cancer. Stage four. They told her you have a few weeks to leave. My mom called me and asked me, man, this woman is going to die. She's going to die. And she called me and the woman was in the living room with mom. I remember, of course, during that time, what did I, I had faith. I just got anointing oil. <laughs> I told my mother, let's anoint this woman by faith. My mom was there. She's my witness. She's in this room right now. We poured oil on Kedres and spoke words. 2018 Kedres is still alive. No trace of cancer. We don't do the miraculous because we can. We do the miraculous because we feel. The Bible says we have not a high priest who is not touched with our infirmities. The Jesus you serve he feels every, he loves you that much that everything that hurts you hurts him in spite of your stupidity. Whether you did it or you did not do it, 
everything that happens in your life hurts and grieves the Son of God. He says, we have not a high priest, okay, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. This Jesus feels every weakness. He feels every pain that those people feel. There is nobody right now sick in the bed and Jesus doesn't feel that pain. He feels it. That is why every time you're talking about the seeking of the Lord, like I've shared before in the book of Acts, he says that they might seek him if happily they might feel after him and find him. You cannot find who you don't feel after. You cannot find who you don't feel after. Do you know there are times I've been in a meeting and a pain has come in my, on my body? Many times. You know how the Bible says he bore our, our infirmities? Sometimes when I'm ministering under the anointing, a pain comes and I know it's not mine. And I say there's somebody with this issue. And when they come and I lay hands on them, they're healed. I remember one time I was finishing service, what I did not share. I, I said there's somebody with a pain in a hip. Th there was a pain in my hip. Literally, I could feel the pain those people are feeling. Call them in front. Laid hands on them. And the moment I laid hands on them, the pain departed. How did I know that they were healed? I felt it depart off my very hip. Sometimes, even as a person, you might carry pain for somebody. God puts you in the place of that person to know how they feel. Because this is a love issue. It's not just, it's not just a luxury miracle. It's not just something you do because you can Jesus did not come to the world to show off power. No. He came to save men. Jesus came to save men. Put love in the equation of service. Don't just serve. Don't just serve. One time, a certain believer started speaking things about me. Very evil things about me. Very ungodly things about me. Very ungodly things about me. And I remember every time I used to go home, I used to go on my knees and I found myself praying for this believer. She spoke and spoke and spoke and I went on my knees and prayed. And then one day, somebody brings me a story that this person was ailing in hospital and dying. She was sick. Because love rejoices not in, it rejoices not in, rejoices not in, evil. I could not rejoice that the daughter of God was sick. Oh, then, like some people are, I would have started clapping, aha, uh -huh. so you see, she abused me. When you abuse a man of God, that's what happens to you. I told you, that you will die, you will see, you understand? And so I learned that she was sick. The human me, at that particular point, said, uh huh, God has vindicated his own. <laughs> glory, glory. <laughs> I went back home that evening and I went in my bedroom and the Lord came. Jesus. He said, Grace, the woman is sick. The woman is sick. And I asked him straight, uh huh. God, that's what happens when they touch your own. <laughs> he told me foolish. Go pay her bills. The next day, I got my car, went in that hospital, paid all the bills of this woman and walked away. Oh, she didn't even know I did it. Because I don't need her to know. And I reached back home and the voice of the spirit said, now I have promoted. I said, hey. <laughs> wow. In my human self, the reason, if you ask me why I know that I'm born again, it is because I have, Bananga, I've tried to hate. <laughs> me who you see here, I've tried not to forgive but I have found every time that that very heart of God in my spirit always causes me to forgive even the unforgivable.
it's painful. But sometimes I have to look at my ministry and you. And then I think about this person who has abused me and done all these things. And I choose you. I choose to minister to you. Because I have a choice to hold on to this person and carry my anger too. Amen. One years ago, I judged a man. And that man almost died. I had to go back to God to plead for him not to die. From then on, I don't boast in the anointing on my life to judge a man. I don't boast in it. Because the son of God did not come to the world to condemn it. But he came that through him all might be saved. Sometimes I think to myself and I'm like, but God, this person, no. There was a time, some time back, I went on my knees and wept for a certain man who I felt was even going to die. Why? Because this man has walked off the course of love and he's fighting me. But the more the man fought me, the more I found on my, myself on my knees praying for this man. God, preserve him. Help him. Restore him. Heal him, God. Bring him to the understanding of this knowledge. Help him understand the love that you carry for him. And let, him let him understand. Let him know you, God. Forgive him. I forgive him. You understand? And I remember one of those days, I wept with my very... You know, you know it's hard for men to weep. But that day I found myself weeping because I... I, 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 I was weeping and in my head I'm looking at this guy and I can't believe I've forgiven him. But I chose to forgive. And every time I let go I feel that the faith in me rises. The faith to do the miraculous rises. I have seen myself increase in the degree of a miraculous. I've seen myself increase in the degree of the supernatural. I've seen myself increase in the degree of the financial. I've seen myself increase in the degree of many things. That if you saw me in the demonstration of the spirit, I've seen myself increase in the demonstration of the spirit. But I've always had these milestones of experience where my love walk was tested. And I had the option to choose the next level or to stay under having an issue with this little person. You keep quiet and then somebody thinks that because you're quiet, you don't have power, you don't have anything. And, and, and of course, when you're talking of the simple, it even becomes ugly because when they're talking to simple people about you and you're not answering or speaking back, oh, maybe there's things that show that maybe, hey, yeah, maybe it's true, I don't know. And people continue and continue and continue and continue and continue. And the devil pushes you in a corner to just get a word out of you. And then I went to God and I told God, what should I do? And as you think for a moment, the spirit comes in the most audible voice and tells you, keep quiet. Now you think you're going to bypass that and go on a prayer mountain with your bitterness. Springing out of you, defile many. That's what was with Simon the sorcerer. He came and wanted the miraculous. He wanted to bite. And you know what the son of the, 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 the apostle tells him? He tells him, you have no part, no lot in this matter. For your heart is not right in you. If we examine you, for in you is a girl of bitterness and a bond of iniquity. Your heart has some iniquity. It has bitterness against somebody. God cannot give his gift on you. He can't let it. There are people, if they were anointed, they would destroy many people. God is doing them a favor to reduce their ministries. They are gifted, but they will never go anywhere. Have you met people who talk and you're like, but why doesn't this guy have a ministry? Seriously, or why does this man's ministry look this, this way? Always going to their heart, there is something wrong with the love walk. Always with the love walk. It's always with the love walk. I have learned to forgive the unforgivable. I have learned to let go. Recently, a certain person called me on phone and abused me. Out of foolish things. And you know what? I heard and I kept quiet. I kept quiet. I didn't answer them. I found myself forgiving them. 
And the next thing I know, this person finds me on the street like they've not done anything to me. Hello, how are you? I need a prayer. I... This woman abused me on phone. Somebody accused me, and then this person calls and abuses me, very heavy words, even goes boasting how they've abused me, you understand? And then my silence meant that I was, you know, gullible and weak. The pain was there. I wanted to curse her. I wanted her to die. I wanted her to eat poison, get in a car accident, the flesh. And then this person appears before me, just out of the blue, and they act like nothing happened. Hello! I thought we were going to follow up from the abuses. He says, I need a prayer. Christians, this happened to me. Much as you might find it unbelievable, but before the Lord and my salvation, this is true. That people have issues in this world. So person comes and says, pray for me. Ask them, what do you want? They tell me everything. I pray for them. I bless her. God increase her. Multiply her. Do this to her. Do this to her. I have my mother thing. There's a chica in there saying, punch her. But there's a colonel guy saying. <laughs> and after that, as though that's not enough. He says, can I have a photo with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First John chapter 3 verses 14. We know that we have been translated from death to life because we love the brethren. He says, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That's what Kenneth was saying. If you don't walk in love, you die. Or you're dead. My goodness. Guy, you're not, guy, you're not screaming. Shakalaba. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, people stand up. Mm, preach apostle. They even hope. Now, now. <laughs> there is no amen, nothing. They're all looking at each other like, eh? Do you want to be used of God? Walk in love. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. He says that is how we know that we have passed from death and to life. We haven't passed from death into life because we do miracles. We have not passed from death into life because we see signs, miracles, and wonders. No, we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Bandange, that thing is deep. You should have seen me smiling in, in front of that camera. Like. And the thought in my head that this person could even use that photo and destroy me the more, but still, Lubega, smile because you're born of God. You're born of God. Hallelujah. First John chapter 4, verse 16. I'll end with that because of time. But I had a lot to say. Give me the amplified. The amplified Bible. He says, and we know understand, recognize, are conscious of by observation and by experience and believe and adhere to put our faith and trust in lion that the love of God, listen, the Bible says, cherishes for us, the love God cherishes for us. He says, we know this love that God wishes for us. He says, God is love and he who dwells, who dwells and continues in love dwells and continues in God. For God dwells and continues in him. Did you hear that? He that continues in love, God continues to dwell in him. Now, translate that. If you continue to walk in the love of God, the anointing of the spirit continues working in your life. If you continue walking in the love of God, God continues in you for God dwells and continues in a man who carries love. 
If you want to have a constant life of the anointing, where every time you stand, the power of God is evident. Never walk out of the love, the love equation. Never walk out of the law of love. He says, if, the, this is God cherishes for us this, that he is love, and he who dwells and continues in love, dwells and continues in God, and God dwells and continues in him. How can you miss that? God continually dwelling. And does that mean that when you walk out of love, he walks out of you? No. Here, we're not talking about Jesus saying, I've left you because you've walked out of love. No. It means that the operation of his power leaves you. He doesn't leave you, but the operation of his power leaves you. There are some miracles certain people will never see. Watch a man who does the miraculous. I'm talking of a miraculous, opening a blind eye, opening a deaf ear, because those are the things that qualify the kingdom. Watch, not in the counterfeit, the real men of God who do these things and check, examine their lives, you will see that they have a place with love. They always do. They always do. God continues with them. Somebody shout hallelujah. Let's continue the next verse. I want us to finish that. In this union and communion with him, the Bible says, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us as we continue in this love, right? That we may have confidence for the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him because as he is, so are we in this world. That scripture is for people who have been complete in love. It's not for every Christian who thinks they can claim it. Oh no, you do. 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 Walk out of love and do everything you want in this world and just mess up everybody and think that as he is, so are you. But we claim that scripture. As he is, that's all of them scream. You even have screamed exactly the way you scream it. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because, next verse. Let's, let's finish that. So, he says, there is no fear in love. I wish some of you understand the depth of that sentence. The doctor said you have cancer, stage four. And God tells you there is no fear in love. That means when you understand how much you are loved by God, you can't fear any report. That's how I know that some people who think they can destroy you can never destroy you. I always go back to that love by which the Lord loves me. And I say, surely God. Would you let this goon destroy me? And he says, uh-uh. I love you too much. And the fear goes. The fear goes. I'm talking of goon the devil. Do you understand what I'm saying? Ha have you had something? He says, full grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of the doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with, a, with it the thought of punishment. And remember, as a man thinketh so, the moment you have fear, whatever you fear comes. You understand? And the next verse says, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, no, no, no go back before. Whoa, 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 go back before. I had not finished that. He says, and so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love and is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. And the next verse says, next verse says, we love him because he first loved us. And the next verse says, and if anyone says, I love God and hates, detests, abominates his brother in Christ, he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You're deceiving yourself. And the next verse says, and this command, charge, order, injunction, we have from him that he who loves God shall love his. I know this is not a popular sermon, but faith worketh. And that's why Paul says, and this I do, that I walk void of offense toward God and man. You walk void of offense toward God and man. Let them wrong you. Don't wrong them. Yes. 
Let them say anything about you. Don't say back. Be the foolish one. Let them hurt you. Don't revenge. Hold your peace. You will be amazed at the things God will do in your life. Your servant will leave. Your business will leave. Your ministry will leave. Your marriage will leave. Your relationship will leave. Your career will leave. Why? Because you've chosen to lose the battle and win the war. Many people cannot see power because of their love work. Examine yourself. Don't examine your next sister and say, ah, uh -huh, I think that is why Rita is not married. No. You examine yourself. Some of you, you're even asking for husbands. You don't even know agape. You're around Eros and Stoge. And then you're saying, pray for me that I get a husband. To do what? Come on, get to your feet. <laughs>